All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm sure there's going to be more folks coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We appreciate you attending today. We've got a great webinar ahead brought to you by Modern Hire and Talent Board. And the title of this webinar is Better Hiring Through Data Using AI to Build a More Diverse Workforce. And really excited uh, to have this discussion today with our guest presenters. And let me go ahead and introduce those. Uh, we've got Eric Seidel and Catalina Flores from Modern Hire who are going to be presenting today. Lots of great takeaways and insights for you. So Eric, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to you. And then we'll, we'll, by the way, before we get started, we will take questions at the end of the webinar. If you've got them throughout, make sure to you know post them either in the Q&A part of the console or the chat function. And then once they wrap up their presentation, we'll make sure to get the, those questions to them and answer them live. And uh, we will also be recording the session too. But again, we appreciate you being here live today. So Eric and Catalina, take it away. All right, thank you, Kevin, appreciate it. And thank you all for joining today. Uh, we're excited to talk about this topic uh, and uh, just do some brief intros here. So my name is Eric Seidel. I'm the EVP of Innovation at Modern Hire, and by training and background, I'm an industrial psychologist, um, as are a lot of us at Modern Hire. Um, in my role, I oversee our innovation team, which includes a bunch of data scientists and psychologists, and our focus these days is really on making better use of data. So um, collecting candidate data in particular and trying to understand how that data predicts likelihood of success in the job. And so we do a lot of research around that and are always looking at new techniques and trying to drive the field forward so that we can better assess candidate potential um, more validly and more fairly. And um, so that's a little bit about me and I'm fortunate to be joined today by one of our newest panelists, uh, Catalina Flores who is also a psychologist and uh, completing her PhD work now. And uh, I'll pass it over to her to say hello. Thanks, Eric. I'm Catalina. I sit in the professional services team as Modern Hire, as Eric mentioned. So I work with a variety of clients across different industries to build, tailor, and validate pre-hire assessments. And in my work, um, I make sure that our assessments provide a positive experience for candidates, give them an accurate representation of what to expect in their roles, and that they're fair and legally defensible. So my training is also an industrial organizational or IO psychology. I have a master's degree from the University of Akron and I'm currently finishing my PhD. My doctoral research has centered around diversity in the workplace in the context of employee selection and performance management. And I'm really broadly interested in how we can cultivate equitable work environments that truly harness the benefits of diversity. So today I'll be sharing some of my research with you all and I'm just really excited to be here and I love having these types of conversations. So looking forward to chatting. Awesome, that's great. Thanks, Catalina. Yeah, and I'm particularly excited because uh, she's gonna be talking about her, her dissertation research and it's very relevant for the diversity topic and it's also very cutting edge, um, just you know, being completed now. So it's exciting to be able to talk about some leading edge research and thinking. I, I wanna do just a little bit of background on Modern Hire. Um, we are a global company, um, operate in over 200 countries and territories and have over well over 300 clients globally, about half of the Fortune 100 clients. Um, we have a lot of PhD level IO psychologists and data scientists, over 40 at last count, and lots of product and engineering resources internally as well. Um, we've been fortunate to win a lot of different awards with our clients in conjunction with our clients um, for different solutions that we've put together most recently. Um, one of our clients, Walmart, won uh, an award called the HRM Impact Award, which is given out every year for companies that make use of data in the hiring process and show how that data is um, really related to outcomes that matter for um, the organization. And as you might imagine, Walmart has a lot of data to do those sorts of analyses with. 
Um, at Modern Hire, our expertise is in what we call the middle of the hiring funnel. So we're focused on screening, assessing, and interviewing candidates and using the information that comes out of those steps to do a better job of predicting likelihood of success in the job. And um, not just more valid, but also more fair. Um, so we do spend a lot of time working on issues like bias and diversity and how to enable, how to um, manage those and to do better with them in the hiring process. Um, but some of our tools also include chat and texting capabilities and schedulers like automatic scheduling functionality, uh, lots of different variations on interviewing asynchronous or live and lots of different reporting and analytics features as well. So that's a little bit about our background as a company and, uh, and what we do. Um, the next thing is we're, we're gonna talk a bit about AI and about predictive hiring and then we're going to sort of move into diversity and inclusion topics and talk a bit about how AI and uh, modern hiring tech can be used to enable better diversity and inclusion. And then we'll close. We'll talk about ethical standards um, in, in our field that are relevant for this topic and some of the ways that we're working on uh, using AI to reduce bias, some of the specific ways. And as Kevin said at the beginning, uh, please, please come up with questions. Uh, we love to encourage dialogue. We'll probably hold them till the end, um, but would be great and would love to hear from you. So a little bit of background here, um, just the perspective of the presentation today where um, the, the topic of diversity and inclusion is, is very big and it's been important for a long time, but it seems like this year of 2020 has seen a lot of events in the, in the news media and, you know, socially around the country and world that made it an even bigger topic. And so we see a lot of our clients are um, having an increased amount of interest in the topic of diversity and inclusion and really wanting to drive it uh, in, in a way that um, maybe, you know, it wasn't quite as high of a priority in the past as it seems to be now, which is, which is great. And so, you know, at Modern Hire, we're very committed to researching, creating and advancing tools that promote the most valid and fair hiring outcomes possible. Um, and we have a lot of researchers like myself um, that you know, spend a lot of time thinking about this. And, and one, of the, one of the realizations that we have from the hiring process is that humans are universally prone to making biased decisions. And as psychologists, you know, we spend a lot of time studying this, but people are not good at taking into account a lot of data and then you know, using it to predict an outcome come in a fair and valid way. Um, we're, we're much more prone to using superficial characteristics and, you know, different inherent biases that we have to drive our decisions. And so um, there's a big role of AI and, um, you know, statistical reasoning in creating a better, more fair hiring process. And we're going to, we're going to get into that here shortly. Um, right now, I want to um, just look at a few definitions uh, to get us started here. I'm going to turn it over to Catalina to take us through these, these definitions, which are certainly common words that we're familiar with, but we want to be clear in how we define them. Thanks, Eric. I think, um, as you said, these are common words that we hear all the time, but I think it's really important just to make sure that we all get on the same page with some of these definitions. So first is bias. And the way we think of bias is favoring one person or group over another in a way that's typically considered unfair. So for our purposes, when we are building assessments, we analyze how our measures are working to make sure that they predict performance equally well across protected class status. Um, and typically we look at age, gender, and race. Diversity is a group characteristic. So it's important to call out here that people aren't diverse just by themselves, but groups can be diverse by having representation of different social categories and identities like race, class, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and you know there are lots more characteristics that could go in here as well. And then 
An inclusive environment is one that provides equal opportunities and fosters a culture where people feel that they can be their authentic selves. And so all three of these are highly relevant to the topic today. You know, primarily ensuring that our hiring systems are free of bias will facilitate having more diversity within workplaces. But it's important to note that bias has to do with the decision process. So if we have a candidate pool that's mostly white and male, we can make unbiased decisions, but still land in a spot where we have an organization that remains mainly white and male. And so, you know, that being said, it does present opportunities to look a little bit earlier in the funnel and we can instead think about maybe the way that we're looking at our qualifications to get to our applicant pool. And that could be biased. So if we think that a job requires a master's degree, but it could really be done well with a bachelor's and we would see more diversity among bachelor's degree holders, then that could be a different opportunity to get rid of bias. Um, and just to sum it up again, diversity is basically having a seat at that table and inclusion is the feeling that you actually belong there and your perspective is valued. So when you have diversity without inclusion, people feel like they're included uh, as tokens and that can be really isolating and harmful. So it's important to consider all of these and how they work together. Uh, I'll pass it back to Eric now for some definitions on the AI topic. Great, all right, thank you. Um, so with, um, you know, with that understanding, we'll move forward and talk a little bit about AI and predictive hiring sort of in general, and then we'll talk, um, we'll get into more specifics around diversity and how we can use, um, this type of hiring to enable better diversity. So real quick, um, whenever we talk about AI, I like to do some basic definitions here. So, um, you know, AI, artificial intelligence is just broadly computational reasoning. So, you know, that little picture of a calculator there is sort of an example of AI and early AI maybe. Um, machine learning is a term that's used a lot just to describe ways that we model and optimize business outcomes um, or any outcome, um, but where we're using a lot of data and crunching it using um, various different statistical techniques. And then a really exciting thing in um, AI in the AI field is deep learning. And deep learning is this new technique um, that was really only created um, at the sort of a little bit after like 2006 or so. It started to come on the scene. And since then, it's been developed like crazy. And self driving cars and um, smart speakers and image recognition software and you know, all kinds of things that are really changing our world are the product of deep learning specifically. That is the really transformative, exciting stuff. But, you know, when we talk about AI and, and when vendors in the space talk about AI, I think of it broadly as just like really advanced analytics because there's so many different definitions of what someone might mean by AI that it, um, for most purposes, you can think of it as just really advanced analytics. Now, when we talk about it, we're also, we're using a range, we're, we're using that term to mean a range of different things. The most exciting things that we do are definitely deep learning based and we'll show, um, we'll talk about a little bit of that later. So when we talk about data and collecting data in the hiring process and using that data to predict outcomes that matter for our clients, um, we like to say that there's a lot of different types of data quality. So um, in the hiring process, you might use assessments, you might use interviews, you might look at resumes, LinkedIn profiles, um, or even, you know, other social feeds, Facebook or Twitter feeds, you know, or that sort of thing. So on the one hand, as a data analyst and a data scientist, we want all the data we can get to use in our predictive equations. The more data, the better, right? Um, and so we'll, we'll take any sort of data that our clients might have. We like to see it all. But... Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't differences in the quality of the data that we see. And so this, this chart sort of shows the, the quality of data. So on the left side, the lowest quality data, we call incidental data. And this is, you know, things like Facebook profiles and um, characteristics of the person that are not really meant to be used in the hiring process. You know, and it could be the sound of your voice. It could also be your facial features. 
um, you know, things like that that are not consciously intended to be used in the hiring process. Some, some, some companies are, you know, trying to use that information predictively. And so far, it's been pretty unproven. There's not a lot of um, main peer-reviewed solid research showing that those sources of data are predictive of job success um, or fair. And so then we have trace data. That's like button clicks and mouse movements and things like that we can measure in our simulations and assessments. Um, and that stuff can be a little bit predictive, but it's not hugely valuable typically. Then we have narrative data. And this is where we start to get into information that's consciously provided by candidates for use in the hiring decision. And that means it's, it's sort of higher quality for that reason alone. Um, LinkedIn profiles and resumes, um, you know, text things, things that are written out, statements, uh, answers to questions, that sort of thing. Um, so that information is often pretty good, but, um, you know, not universally so. So there's a lot of less predictive and more biased sources of data in that category as well. The best, the best, most predictive, most studied, um, most controlled, most easily to, you know, sort of verify that it works and that it's fair is the intentional response data. And that is assessment data, primarily assessment data. But, you know, so like multiple choice questions, if you think of that sort of thing. Um, traditionally, there's, there's tons of research on assessments and how they predict job performance for different jobs. Um, you get a, they're quantitative measures, so you can easily measure group differences and ensure they're fair and so forth. And increasingly, we're able to score text responses, open-ended comments, or um, spoken words. Like the, what I'm saying right now could be scored using our system on different competencies. So our system can listen to me talk, and it can transcribe the words that I'm saying, and it can give me a score on different job-relevant competencies. Um, using deep learning and natural language processing. So some of the most advanced stuff that we talked about on that previous slide, um, we can do now, which is really exciting. So, um, so that's sort of a range of, of data quality there that I wanted to share just as sort of level setting to help us understand the, the further we are to the right, the more valid, the more measurable, the more fair um, these, these data sources tend to be. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI. AI is, of course, just tons and tons of hype about AI. Um, and a lot of the press around it the last several years has been a bit on the negative side. And so um, that's with, with good reason. Um, there's been a lot of AI applications that have been poorly thought through and initially, at least how AI was rolled out. And so if you have a big set of data and you study it with AI, to create scoring rules for that data. If there are biases already inherent in that data, the AI will just replicate those biases and scale them out at an even larger scale. So you can basically scale bias using AI if you develop it that way. And, and I think that early on, that's what happened a lot. So um, the irony is that while AI can cause bias if it's done poorly, it's also the solution to bias if it's done correctly. Uh, because AI can, different AI techniques can, can very well analyze candidate data and look, they can be programmed to look for bias for group differences and things. So we can better control it um, using AI. Um, I'll just real quick show a few examples of some of the problems with AI historically over the last several years. If you train it, if you train AI, to tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a wolf. This is some research from a couple of years ago. Um, it can do that pretty well. And the study was done on this. And after it was done, the, re the researchers found that the AI was able to tell wolves from dogs very well. But then they realized that uh, the reason it was able to do that was because the wolves tended to be in snowy backgrounds and the dogs tended to be on manicured grass. And that's really what the uh, algorithm them had been looking for was grass or snow, nothing to do with the animal itself. So, you know, that's an example of how you can um, think that you're predicting something well, but uh, end up with a sort of spurious result. Another big problem you've heard a lot about deep fakes. Um, these are 
increasingly common. There's something called cheap fakes too, which is um, where there are videos that are, you know, designed to put someone else's words on and someone else's, you know, face and video. Um, and they're not done very well. They're cheap, but um, they still have some impact on the, on the discourse in the, in the public arena. So, um, and then, you know, one of the biggest problems in our space, I think, is just marketing hype. Um, there's just a ton of hype around AI um, as a term. And as I indicated earlier, it can mean a lot of different things. So just because a tool says that it's developed using AI doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, great, that it's doing something wonderful or that it's developed really rigorously or well, or that it's fair or valid or anything like that. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, ultimately AI, AI is very, it's a complicated new tool that our entire civilization is wrestling with right now. Um, you know, and we are in hiring as well, endeavoring to make use of it because it's such a powerful tool, but also to understand it and understand its limitations and things. So, you know, it's not universally a good thing. Um, there can be negative applications of any powerful tool. Um, but that is a little bit of background on, you know, AI in general. Now, that was kind of some negative stuff, but we also do see a lot of power and potential in AI in the hiring space. And so some of the ways that it is being used um, most often are for better assessment scoring, um, helping us to identify passive candidates that might be good fit. You'll see it used a lot for resume parsing, so understanding resumes better, um, or taking the bias out of resumes and things like that. Um, and that is fine, um, we typically say, but at the same time, you have to recognize that the resume itself is not a particularly great source of data about a person. They tend to be, um, you know, a not, not an overly valid predictor of a person's success in the job. Um, Chatbots are getting better and better all the time due to AI. Um, we can score unstructured data, which is, as I mentioned earlier, that's speaking and, you know, text, that something I might type, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of applications in bias control, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, and just overall, you know, giving real-time feedback to candidates as well as shortening the overall hiring experience and limiting it down to just the predictors that really, really work. And AI can help us do all those things. So a lot of positive aspects of, of AI there for sure. Um, you know, in general, we recognize at Modern Hire that the hiring process is often very employer-centric. Um, it's, it's not, you know, candidate centric per se, but a lot of the best employers as the talent board can tell you and, and Kevin can tell you, um, you know, are really focusing their processes around what is helpful and um, beneficial for candidates. And so that is a, a very, very important thing to keep in mind. AI, AI is very powerful, um, but we really need to harness AI to help individuals. Um, otherwise, it'll eventually become hyper-efficient for corporations and kind of have a dehumanizing effect. And so we want to guard against that in the AI world by making sure we're consciously using it to really benefit the individual. So, you know, the, one of the big ways that AI can, can help us in um, the topic of diversity is by controlling bias. So while it can create bias when it's implemented incorrectly, it can also help control it when we do it the right way. We can balance um, the prediction of performance with diversity needs. Um, AI can help us make more consistent ratings than a human being can. AI can also help us to ignore irrelevant information that could be potentially biasing. So our opportunity at Modern Hire and in hiring in general is to you know, take a very proactive stance in how we're developing and using AI, making sure that it's really beneficial for the individual, not just a corporation. Um, and, you know, we're also very focused on research, um, supporting research and publishing research um, and explaining our findings so that we can kind of, you know, bring the whole field along and create a better um, experience for, for everyone. Uh, and that, and a great example of that is Catalina's research, which she'll be talking about here. And I think I'm going to 
turn it over to you now, right, for this, uh, this slide. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Eric. So I think that a lot of these, uh, you know, the negative press that we're seeing and this weariness toward AI is justified. Um, and we really need to make sure with our ethical AI approach as we do that these tools are being used correctly uh, in order to control bias. On the other hand, an alternative might be to simply rely on human judgment. Um, but we, as you mentioned, our human judgment is incredibly flawed as well. So as much as we can try to be fair, we tend to overlook how biased our own perceptions can be. So broadly speaking, bias in and of itself is really not a bad thing because we're constantly overwhelmed with information. And it only makes sense that we have adapted to use certain cognitive shortcuts to make decisions. But where it gets tricky is, you know, in the traditional sense of how we're using bias now, when our biases result in decision making that's unfair toward people of certain groups. So this graphic to the right shows just some of the biases that humans are susceptible to. And in the selection context, uh, when looking to differentiate candidates, we tend to have a bias against anyone who doesn't mirror ourselves. And that's why Title VII has defined protected classes and makes it illegal to discriminate on protected class status. So just to go over some, some biases, uh, some of these biases really quickly, there are cognitive biases like the halo effect. If we notice one thing that we really like about somebody as they come into an interview, like they have really nice shoes, then that can cloud our judgment so that we inflate uh, how we see other unrelated characteristics. Like maybe they also have very limited prior work experience, but we think that that's okay. And on the flip side, a horn effect would happen if we hold on to one characteristic that we see as negative. Like maybe we see on their resume that a candidate lives in a bad neighborhood. And then that clouds our judgment about the candidate as a whole. And these are general cognitive biases, but you can see how it ties in with diversity um, because these judgments are often linked with protected class characteristics. Um, and we just can't help but make judgments on characteristics that end up being totally irrelevant to job performance. So even things like tattoos, clothing, and hair. And this is where technology can really help us by supplementing the information that we already have with a less biased and systematic tool for comparison. I also want to call out here the distinction between explicit and implicit bias. Um, so this is specific to the diversity domain. People that have explicit bias are very clear in that they hold a certain prejudice and treat others differently. And this could result in verbal harassment and things like that in the workplace. But implicit bias, on the other hand, is more subtle and insidious. So it could be a belief, a prejudiced belief that you're not even aware of that values one social group or category over another. And the two are not mutually exclusive. So you can consciously believe in equity and have no explicit bias, but still hold implicitly biased beliefs that affect how you see the world and make judgments. The point of this all being that human judgment can be biased in a lot of ways that we aren't even aware of. And even with our AI tools, we always have to keep an awareness that no technique is inherently free of bias. And this is something that we always have to think about and monitor on an ongoing basis to make sure that we're continuing to be fair. So why does this matter? Well, first, we're seeing more and more today that clients and the public expect this now. Recently, there's been lots of public pressure on companies to not only publicly state their values regarding diversity and inclusion, but also to include measurable action items. People want to see that companies are willing to put time and resources toward diversity goals. And importantly, diversity also lays a foundation for strong performance. So in here, I've included some research by McKinsey and Company that speaks to this. They have found that diverse and inclusive organizations actually perform better. So it's not only great for morale and growth, but there is a significant financial impact as well. And this uh, is also confirmed with research by Boston Consulting Group that shows that companies with more diverse leadership report higher innovation revenue. 
Uh, but with that, there are some important caveats to make here. So first is that, you know, by measuring success this way, it's a really narrow view of success. And it's important to take a look at the broader picture in terms of the benefits that diversity provides us. And that also encompasses less tangible things. So we shouldn't only be looking at financial performance and things like that, but learning, innovation, creativity, flexibility, um, equity, and those things as well. And another important note, and quoting from this article um, that was published on Harvard Business Review here, is uh, makes an excellent point that increasing diversity does not by itself increase in effectiveness. What matters is how an organization harnesses diversity and whether it's willing to reshape its power structure. So increasing just the numbers of traditionally underrepresented people in your work environment won't automatically produce these benefits. The climate and the work environment is important as well. So we sit in the middle of the funnel as Eric laid out, but none of this happens in a bubble. And I think it's also helpful to think about how this fits into the broader system. And to look a little later into the funnel here post hire, it's absolutely critical that an organization provides an inclusive climate that they value, that they utilize fair practices as well as socially integrate underrepresented groups into the work environment. Um, this is where my research lies and it's a relatively new area of research, but there is evidence that uh, perceptions of supportive inclusion climates appear to improve job attitudes like job satisfaction, commitment to an organization, job engagement, as well as sales performance and customer satisfaction. And companies with more inclusive climates are also related to fewer turnover intentions and less absenteeism. So a supportive inclusive inclusion climate is related to decrease in employees' propensity to leave the organization. So on this topic, uh, I want to briefly share some more about the research I've been working on, where I explored whether a favorable inclusion climate was related to better interpersonal dynamics at work. The level of trust in one supervisor, the amount of feedback sought from one supervisor, and work stress. Those are the specific outcomes I was looking at. Um, inclusion climate has already been linked with other outcomes that I mentioned in terms of job attitudes, but with this study, I wanted to see if that would extend to interpersonal relationships as well. And the theory behind this being that in organizations with favorable inclusion climates, employees will feel more trusting of their supervisors, be more comfortable approaching them to ask for feedback on their performance when they need it, and therefore will be able to do their jobs more effectively, manage their time better, and then have less stress. So I tested this in a sample with diverse working individuals so that we could also look at effects based on race. And here I hypothesized that inclusion climate would be associated with favorable outcomes for everybody, regardless of race, but that there would be stronger relationships for people of color who are likely more attuned to diversity cues in their workplace. And here we found some interesting and surprising results. So first, the relationships that I've laid out at the top uh, in that first bullet here did emerge as expected. So more positive perceptions of inclusion climate were associated with significantly higher reported trust in the supervisor, uh, feedback seeking behavior, and less work stress. So it's showing that having an inclusive climate does affect these interpersonal relationships as well as job attitudes. But the effect of race was actually the opposite of what was hypothesized in that these associations were stronger for the white employees and weaker for employees of color. So in order to wrap our minds around this, a couple of things came up. Um, first point I wanna make is that 
I've often heard a reluctance toward inclusion efforts because there's this perception that they could result in backlash from majority group members. And these results really debunk that myth, I think. And it shows that, that working in an inclusive environment where you get distinct perspectives and different opinions and ideas are shared, that provides a better work environment for everybody, not just minority group members. But on the flip side, it was odd to see that those relationships were weaker for employees of color. And that got us thinking about when we asked participants about the inclusion climate, what that measure really captured. So as I mentioned, there were two pieces to inclusion climate, the fair practices and social integration. And by looking at my measure more closely, I realized that I was capturing more of the fair practices piece. So is this a place where discrimination is not tolerated? And what I'm thinking is that while that is important and necessary, employees of color in particular really need more of that second piece. So the social integration, not only being invited to the work environment and not being discriminated against, but actively having their perspectives sought out, valued and included. So it's sort of like the diversity and inclusion distinction that uh, we mentioned at the beginning. And we're currently looking into a follow-up that will measure both pieces of this distinctly so that we can confirm whether this thinking is correct to follow up. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Eric. I think that this quote captures this well and it applies in a lot of areas. So inclusion is a buzzword right now, uh, but we're really seeing is that when it comes down to our actions, Current efforts at diversity management tend to come from a shallow understanding of diversity, meaning the varied perspectives and approaches to work that members of different groups bring, rather than inclusion or the way an organization configures its systems to best leverage potential. So this came up in, in my own research and that my measure captured a more shallow perspective of the inclusion climate. And it's certainly something to keep in mind with the other topics that we discuss here today. So I'm still wrapping up this study and you all got the inside scoop here, um, but this is what I'm seeing so far and I'm excited to share this research with you. I would love to get some input. Um, and there are already so many possibilities for future studies to expand on and to kind of clarify these results. So I know that we've deviated from the topic of AI and hiring a little bit, but I do think it's important to zoom out a bit and really think about what environment you're cultivating post hire, because otherwise you can have a great hiring process that brings in diverse talent, but then those people end up ultimately unsatisfied and might leave the company. And with this, just another point is that's really interesting to me is that we can start to imagine different ways to leverage AI for more inclusive workplaces. So it's not only hiring, but we can also look at the work environment with this as well. And I've already heard of some work on using technology to detect bias in payroll and performance management systems, but there's lots of opportunity in this place, in this space as well uh, for future work and something that I hope to hear discussed more in these circles. So I would love your thoughts, Eric, if you have any ideas about this. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I'm so glad to get you on with us today. Um, to share this research. And I can say that, I mean, I've, I have always had an interest in the topic of diversity and how we manage it in hiring, but this, uh, you know, a lot of what I've used in the past has been um, some of the relatively simple statistics that you see about how companies that are more diverse perform better. But as I've learned from working with you, that's not the full story. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, that's not about it's not enough just to say more diversity equals good. Um, we have to look more specifically at inclusion and, and the cultural factors that go with that to encourage the benefits of, of diverse perspectives and things. So I think that is just super interesting stuff. And it's really cool to, um, to get you, um, to have you present this cutting edge stuff that you're working on live with us now. Um, it looks, it looks, um, like there's been a few questions coming in and we've got um, 
we'll probably just turn to questions now, if that's all right. Um, and I know it looks like there's one question that came in about your research asking about the timeline mm -hmm. for the rest of your research, Catalina, yes. and how people can learn more about it as uh, you do. Thank you. That's a great question. I'm currently uh, wrapping up my manuscript and preparing it to uh, send in for publication. So I have my email included at the during the last slide on this deck. And if you guys um, would love to stay in touch and you know provide more updates as I finalize this. So I. This was great, by the way. Thank you both very much. And we do have some other questions too, but I, I always like to ask, because there's so much great information that you shared. I mean, again, I think the reality checks on what artificial intelligence really is today and how it applies to, to screening and hiring. And, and then also this deeper dive on diversity and inclusion, I think was extremely important. It, 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 with especially this year more than ever before, even when that's been the top of the list for leadership for many, many years, right? So my question though is where, I mean, what do we do first? Where do we start? How do we move in that direction of being more inclusive and and being, I guess I would argue, right, from a, even a candidate experience perspective, but just being more fair in the screening process. I, maybe that's two questions, but how do we, what do we do first? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that we can all provide some value by starting where we are, you know? So Eric and I work in the selection space, but there are recruiting people who can also think about these issues. And if everybody is uh, paying more attention, then we can all make an impact within these different pieces. So I don't think that it's that cut and dry as in uh, to say that one of these objectives needs to be met first. You know, we can all be working sure. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I think, yeah, there's not, there's unfortunately no silver bullet, um, but it's a lot of different things that have to come together. So, I mean, as Catalina said, you know, we're really focused on how we can use data, um, you know, and how we can de-bias data and how we can help companies to take the normal human biases that we all have out of the equation. And you know what, and that, that, and that's true, but you've also, but you do have to, going back to the leadership part of the equation, they, they have to be on board to want to make this change as well, right? If, if it's, if it's, and it's gotta go beyond, you know, to be frank, it's gotta go beyond lip service of yes, mm -hmm. we, you know, we wanna hire, different ethnicities and, and races and, and, and cultures to say that we're diverse. And um, anyway, you know, not disparaging anybody that's hopefully making that move, but I think it, leadership do, does have to be on board. Along, the, yeah. along, so there's another question that I thought was actually really good. I mean, it was more of a, uh, I'll kind of rephrase it as a question, but when you showed earlier the, the pre-hire predictor data quality, and about the, yep. in, about intentional response that can be discriminatory against people with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. a blind, low sight, motor skills, um, perception challenges. Even if someone stutters, or you know, or the English is not their it's not their primary language; it's their second language. Um, I mean, is what I mean is what do you think about that? I mean, I wasn't really quite yeah. clear on that on their question, but is, how would you respond to that? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a fair question. It's a really good question. Um, you know, there's different aspects of it. There's no perfect question or technique to use in the hiring process. that's going to work for everybody, you know? So, um, that's one of the reasons why there's lots of different tools in the hiring process, lots of different steps interviews and assessments and background checks and, you know, all these different things. So sometimes, you know, any one of those techniques won't work for a certain person. And that's okay, you know, because you're never going to catch everybody with a technique that works for them, you know, right. in, in all ways. So, you know, when we encounter candidates with disabilities that might be, you know, sight related or hearing related or whatever the case may be, you make accommodations for them. So, um, that's the typical path is to say there's 
pretty small number of people that uh, that aren't able to you know see and use a computer to respond to some questions or some exercises so if you encounter them then you need to have a path forward for them that doesn't negatively impact them and so a company would typically say well here's an alternative way to move forward in the process where you don't have to take that assessment or um, you know here's a larger print version of it or something of that nature so those are often you know decided on a on an ad hoc basis i think um, so it, you know it is very very important to make sure that none of the tools that we use have an adverse impact on anybody but you know at the same time um, the intentional response category there gives us the most quantitative and best performing predictive information about large candidate pools so there's you know, there's tremendous predictive power and ROI and, and also, you know, fairness because we're able to measure fairness very easily since those are quantitative measures. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know. There's some, there's some comments that we're going to pass on to you after the webinar to you both, just so you know, um, uh, okay. that I think that'll be good for follow-up for you, not necessarily questions, but good things for you guys to think about and respond to. Um, otherwise, I think, and there's no other questions right now, specifically about the, the content today. Um, th this was great. I mean, again, I, I love, uh, Catalina, the work that you're doing in particular, because I do, I do think that there's this, there's a inherent need to, to really truly understand the differences that you outlined as it relates to inclusion and, and the benefits of mm -hmm. that go beyond. I mean, I know that, you know, there's an article that I read recently and I'm gonna probably misquote it, but it was, it had to do with discriminatory practices against African-American entrepreneurs, for example, and how much, and how much money and, and, and those in the workplace too. And we, we've known some of this stuff for years, but how much money is lost to the economy mm -hmm. because, because of that, of, you know, that could have benefited so many people and created so many more jobs. And I mean, the list goes on and I didn't want to open a diatribe necessarily about that today, but I just think that the work that you're doing as well as the, again, Eric, the, the, the assessment that you guys offer and the work that you're doing there um, to make the process yeah as bias free as possible and more fair is, is super critical today because we're only going to see more automation in the really than the big part of the front end of recruiting and hiring. So, yeah. um, and in the middle, in the middle of the funnel too. So thank you both very much. Um, I totally appreciate your time. And uh, did we get another question? Yeah, there, it does look did. like there's another, another follow-up about the, um, Okay. The comment I made about ad hoc kind of, you know, disability um, accommodations and things. And the question says, you know, when you run into those disability situations yep. and it's ad hoc, how scalable is it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's a great, great question. I mean, typically, we don't run into that situation a lot with assessment. And I mean, keep in mind, we do, you know, we do assessments and interviews and all kinds of things, but mm -hmm. you would, I think we're mostly talking about assessments here, but it's something that our clients encounter pretty rarely. So it's, you know, if it ever rises to be a big enough issue that they're seeing it repeatedly and a lot, then I definitely think that you would need to come up with an alternate, um, alternate way to go. But in the, at least in the assessments that we develop, um, you know, they're designed to be very readable and very, very friendly to the candidate. Um, so it's not like there's a ton of tiny print or anything like that. Thank you very much. Well, listen, thank you both very, very much. We'll pass on some other comments to you all that, that came in as well. And appreciate everybody's time today and have a great rest of the week. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much, everyone.